Hey there my fellow designers and creatives, hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another video in my mega product design course for beginners. In this video, we're gonna learn everything there is to know about designing effective and good surveys. A lot of people who get started in product design underestimate what it takes to make a survey and they make plenty of mistakes and I've seen hundreds of surveys which make no sense and which are not created correctly. So in this video, I'm gonna cover a lot of things that goes into making a good survey. I'm gonna show you a lot of mistakes that people make as well. Okay, now before I get started, make sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a like on the video if you haven't done that already. Okay, let's get started. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about the types of survey. I'm just gonna move this over to the right side so we can focus on this, okay. So, if you wanna send out a survey, you need to have an intent for sending out a survey. Why should you send out a survey? There are three main reasons. One is to identify a target audience. Second is to validate problems that you think you already know. And third is to identify problems. And this is in a situation where you don't know what the problems are and you want to know what the problems are, okay? So these are three main things. Now I'm gonna tell you where this falls into a design process a little bit later, but at an overall level, these are the three types of surveys that you want to do when you're doing UX research. Okay, now moving forward, let's try to understand the mistake 90% of the designers make. Now, 90% is a number that I just came up with randomly. Basically, I'm just trying to say that most of the designers make this mistake. I don't have any data to back up this 90%, so just don't quote me on this 90%. So, the first mistake that people do is sending a survey instead of doing an interview. Now, a survey is to be sent only when you want to quickly collect certain set of information, and mostly it is quantitative information and nothing else. Now, what I'm saying is not the ground rule. There can be exceptions to what I'm saying. And you need to be smart enough as a designer to identify if it's better to do an interview to get the answers or it is better to do a survey. In some cases, survey is better. In some cases, interview is better. But from my general experience, I would recommend that you actually do an interview because you are going to encounter situations and questions and answers that you never thought you would need. Because when you're having a conversation with somebody, a lot of additional things comes up and then you get to understand a lot more rather than just doing a survey, right? It may make sense to do a survey after an interview, but I would suggest you start with an interview. The next is sending survey to the wrong target audience. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen people do is that they come up with a problem statement, they define the target users, but they end up sending it to the wrong groups altogether, right? And this has a negative effect on this. Third thing is asking irrelevant questions in the survey. I've seen so many times that barely two, three questions out of a survey which has 15 questions makes sense. The rest of the 13, 14 questions don't make any sense at all. And it's gathering information that is not going to help you do anything. And the last thing, which is probably the most important, is sending a survey when there is no need. I've seen probably hundreds of case studies online and everybody talks about surveys. And when I see the case study, the first thing that comes to my mind is there was no need to do any survey at all. Like the answers were so obvious, the problem statement was so obvious, the question was so obvious. There was no need to do a survey at all, unless the objective of sending the survey is to validate. Right now, there's nothing wrong in validating, but it's a waste of time. Because in most of the cases, whatever assumptions and constraints you have are correct. Okay, so now that we understand this, let's try to understand the actual design process that you need to follow. Okay, so first of all, you have an idea of the core problem in mind, right? And I'm taking a small example over here, which is let's say you have to design a virtual party platform or an experience for friends and family. Now, this is so vague. We don't really know what it is. We don't really know who we are solving for. It's just such a vague thing, right? Once you have some sort of an idea, you identify who the target audience is, right? So who are you actually designing it for? Now, we just can't say friends and family, right? Because there's a certain category of people we want to actually solve for in this family and in this friend, right? You can't solve for every family or every friend, right? Maybe you're solving it for people who stay very far away from each other, right? Who live in, let's say, different countries, who, let's say, who live in different time zones, right? Or it could be any sort of user group over there, right? So you need to take some time to figure out who you actually want to solve for and be very, very clear and specific about it. Once you have that, you go ahead and identify problems. You have your target audience and then you go ahead and identify what are the current problems that these people face? What is the current behavior like? Can we optimize this behavior, right? You ask all of these questions and you try to identify problems that you think you want to solve. Once you have a list of problems, you go ahead and identify solutions to it. To solve each of the problems, what are the solutions that I can come up with? 
Now, the thing here to understand is if you make a mistake in identifying the target audience and you send questions to the wrong target audience, you're going to get wrong answers, which is basically going to identify wrong problems. And when you identify wrong problems, you're going to go ahead and identify wrong solutions, right? And this becomes this whole loop. And in the end, your case study or project goes for a toss. Right now, another thing that I want to mention, which I didn't mention over here, is I'm going to add this. Make the this the fourth point is blindly believing in uh, uh, from the answers in the survey. I've seen everybody do this. That the moment they see something from the survey, they take it without thinking more about it. They don't, they don't understand why did somebody say this? Is this actually a real problem, right? And sometimes people send it to just five people and make tons and tons of assumptions around it, right? Sending a survey to five people and getting answers for them doesn't prove anything. Yes, you do get some information, but you have to take that information and think about it and decide if you want to trust that information or not, right? So what I'm trying to say is when you get answers, Think about it a little bit more and don't blindly believe it. Okay. So once you have this, let's try to see where surveys fit into this. So the first place where you can put a survey is sending a survey to identify behaviors and users, right? The objective over here is to identify who you want to send this survey to. So in this case, what you would do is you would send it to a large group of people, a family and friends, and you try to get answers from all of them and see what do they do in order to connect with their family and friends on a regular basis? How do they stay in touch, right? That is the objective. And you're going to get all sorts of answers. And out of that, you decide, okay, fine, I want to sort of tackle this problem or I want to sort of target this target audience, right? You identify who you want to solve for because the objective here is to identify behaviors and through that you can understand, okay, I want to solve this for old people, for example, or I want to solve this for people who are students or I want to solve this for students who are living abroad away from their families, right? You want to identify who you, who you want to solve for. Once you define that target audience, you can then go ahead and send out a survey for two different use cases. Now, before I get into this, what I'm what I want you to understand is that you don't have to send three surveys. You just may have to send only one survey. If you already know who your target audience is, you can skip this step. You don't have to send a survey, right? If you know you want to solve for people who are students studying abroad and away from their families, you can just directly go with one of these two options, right? Now, you can send a survey to identify the problems. So you reach out to those people who are students studying abroad, and then you try to identify problems if you don't know what they are. And if you think you already know, let's say you yourself are a student who's living away from your family and you're trying to solve a problem for yourself, you already know a list of problems, right? And you may want to validate it. So you send it out to a bunch of your other friends or classmates or whatever and try to validate what you think are problems, right? So that's the difference between identifying problems and validating problems, right? The intent over here is to identify problems. The intent over here is to validate problems because if you don't know what the intent is, you will not be able to draft the right question. So it's very important you understand the intent so that you can then draft the right questions. And then finally, once you do this, you then have problems. So um, in this case, once you identify problems, you will then have a list of problems. And once you validate them, then you will still have a list of problems because some people said, no, this is a problem. Some people said, yes, this is a problem, right? And then you go ahead and come up with solutions, right? So this is the process that you want to follow. Now I'm going to take you through a couple of surveys that people have made and they sent it to me on Instagram. By the way, if you haven't followed me on Instagram, make sure to do that. I post a lot of useful, knowledgeable design content over there. So definitely follow me there. Okay. So Let's look at the first one, which is to design a product that makes it easy for people to hire maids, right? This is the core problem statement. Now, in this case, the person who made it already defined who the target user was, which is students, working professionals and families. Now, in this case, all of these people are the same. Whether you're a student, whether you're a working professional, whether you're a family, your needs and requirement is the exact same. Maybe you prefer a female maid or a male maid, but in the end, all of these three people have the exact same requirements. So in this case, I would go ahead and reframe this and say, anyone who wants a maid 
for their house because it's very straightforward as to what it is, right? So you can send this to anybody and the answers you get are pretty much going to be the same. Okay, so now let's go look at the survey. Okay, so this is the survey. And uh, as you can see, it says uh, I'm doing a survey for my assignment to understand what problems people face when they are looking for a maid or what problems they have with their current maid, right? And whatever it is. So the intent of this survey is to identify what problems people face, which means the target audience has already been defined. So if you come back over here, we can see that this survey here is to identify problems because, because the target audience has already been defined. Okay. So now the first question is, I've seen this, everybody do this, is your name. Now this is very irrelevant because knowing the name of the person doesn't help. But I understand why people ask this question is because maybe you want to reach out to this person in case of other questions. Now, given that is the intent, I would suggest that you move this part all the way to the end of the survey because it's not really important. At the end, you can ask for the name, phone number, email address, whatever it is, but don't ask that in the beginning. Next, student, working professional, housewife. Now, in my opinion, whether you're a student, whether you're a working professional or you're a housewife, I am very sure that your requirements of what you want from a housemaid are going to be the exact same. Right. So I don't really believe that it's important to ask this question because you're actually solving for all these three people, not just one type of person. So it doesn't matter whether the person is a student or a working professional or a housewife. So this question also could have been skipped. Next, are you looking for a part time maid or a 24 hour maid? Right now, this question does make sense. But again, this is the point where I say you don't really have to ask this question because it's an irrelevant question. Yes, there is a chance that somebody might want a part-time maid or you might want somebody who is a 24-hour maid, right? Now, are you going to cater to people who only want 24-hour maid or are you going to cater to people who want only part-time maids or both? Whatever it is, you decide that. You don't have to ask people what they want. If you decide you want to solve for people who want only 24 hours maid, just solve for them. If you want to solve for people who want part-time maids, just solve for them, right? You don't have to ask this question because it's not going to give you anything in return. Let's say you get most of the people who say 24 hour maids, right? What are you going to do with that information? Let's say you send this to 10 people and eight of them said that they want a 24 hour maid. Does that mean you're not going to solve for people who want a part-time maid? No, definitely not. You're going to target everybody, right? So again, this is an irrelevant question. Now, this is where, how do you find a maid? Through friends, neighbors, and relatives, um, maid hiring agencies, uh, maids themselves come at place, uh, come at your place asking for work, uh, maid communities and residencies. Now, this is a good question. It's an interesting question. It understands the current behavior. But again, I'm not very sure as a designer, what will I do with this information, right? Now, for the person who made the survey, if they actually thought that they had something in mind and they could use this information to come up with solutions, then it makes sense. But at least I, from my perspective, I don't see what I will do with this information. Next, what, cha what challenges do you face when finding a maid? Less number of options. They quote very high prices. Um, isn't sure if they're reliable or not. All right. Um, their timings doesn't match with the preference. You, they have language barrier. And some people say they have no problem at all. Right. Now, there is a good chance that everybody who's looking for a maid faces at least two to three of these problems, right? And it's very obvious that these are the problems. So since we already know what these problems are, we don't really have to ask anybody, are these your problems? Because we already know, yes, we've all lived in houses who have maids or we know people who have had maids and we understand what the problems are and we already know this. So again, it doesn't make sense to ask this question. What do you look for before hiring a maid? Common timing, vaccinated, background check, multilingual speaker. Now, to be very honest, both of these questions are pretty much the same thing, right? This is in a positive tone and this is sort of in a negative tone. These are what challenges and this is what you look for. For example, over here, it says that their timings don't match your preference. And here they say what you look for in hiring a maid, which is common timing, right? Both of these are pretty much the exact same thing. So again, this is a repeated question, but just framed in a different way. And finally, how frequently do you require a maid, right? How does it matter to the designer? Because yes, some people might want it daily. Some people might want on alternate days. Some people might want on weekends. People might want it at a different time, right? But as a designer, how does it help you make a decision? Because in the end, deciding daily versus alternate versus weekdays is sort of taken care of by the conversation between the person who wants to hire a maid and the maid themselves, right? Now, if you are thinking of putting some sort of a filter in your app, that's okay. You can put that filter. 
So people can search for only pe- maids who are available on a daily basis. It's very obvious. You're not trying to compare daily versus alternate days versus weekends because there is a use case for all of them. Finally, what activities do you require a maid for? Brooming, mopping, dishwashing, clothes washing, dusting, dusting, cooking. Yes. People want for all of these. What is the point of asking this question? We already know what people want maids for. And we already know what the answers are. Some people are going to say cooking. Some people are going to combine a couple of them. Some people are going to tick all of them, right? So again, what are you going to do with that information? You already know what the answer is. And finally, how many maids uh, do you have for all of these activities marked about? Again, so you have one, two, three. Now, I'm not sure what is the intent of asking this question. Beat one, beat two, beat three. How does it really matter? Can you please elaborate on the reason why you have multiple maids instead of only one? This seems like a question that is worth asking, but I'm not really sure what answers you will get from it. Finally, what problems do you face with your current or previous maid? Again, same of these things. Steals, comes late, works inefficiently, frequently leaves, language barrier, etc. Right? We know that these are the problems that already exist. These problems are very obvious to the user. Right? If your maid is on leave for one or couple of days, how do you manage chores? Manage yourself. The maid sends somebody else for a period of time. You send, you search for another maid, right? Again, these are behaviors that we already know. What are you going to do with this information? How is this information going to help you identify problems or going to help you come up with even solutions, right? These are things we already know. Do you take a trial service for appointing a maid? Now, typically the answer is no. Typically, it's no, right? But what if it was yes? What are you going to do with that information? What if 10 people say yes and 5 people say no? How is that going to impact your decisions? Some people take trial, some people don't, right? So if in if you are designing your app and you want to come up with this system where you want to do some sort of a free trial, do it. People are more than happy to take the free trial. Why do you have to ask this question? If you think it makes sense to have a free trial, do it. Which user is going to say no for a free trial? right? Again here, so if you have any 50, uh, spare time of 15-20 minutes, ask for a conversation for deeps inside, social media, all of that stuff, right? So obviously keep all those things for the end. So if you see over here, the most important thing that I'm trying to say is if you go back to Figma, right? And I come here to the main things over here. One is we can see that first of all, there was no need to send a survey because all the answers and questions and observations were very straightforward right? Asking irrelevant questions in the survey, we already knew the answers to so many of the questions and we knew what they were. So these two were the main big problems, right? So ideally, this person could have started solving the problem without sending any sort of a survey because they already had a list of requirements that they had mentioned in the survey. And when I say requirements, they knew things about what are the various types of problems when they have the current maid or when they're trying to find maids, what activities they need, how frequently they made. They had all the right information themselves already and there was no need to do a survey. Okay, so now let's go into another one. So let's come back over here and I'm going to look at this one, which is to design a product that makes it easy and safe for women to find roommates, right? This is the core problem. Now, then you have to identify users, which is single women who are currently working or studying, like who are single women who are living alone or maybe probably with another roommate or whatever it is uh, and are working and currently studying. And you want to design a product that makes it easy and safe for women to find roommates. So here again, we know what the target audiences are. And all we have to do now is to identify problems if the problems have not yet been identified. Okay, so let's look at that. Okay, so let's get started. Again, name, age. Do you have a roommate? Yes or no? So name, of course, I already covered all this age again. Why does this matter? Right? Because if you end up sending this survey to like 10 of your friends and all of them belong to, let's say your age of, let's say 20 to 25, for example, does that mean you're not going to solve for women who are above 25 years? What is the objective of finding this? Right? In the end, you want to solve for people or in this case, women who are looking for roommates, right? And it's very obvious that a woman would only look for a woman roommate if she's thinking about safety, right? It's very obvious. Now, do you have a roommate? Why does this make sense? Because you all have, because you have already decided that you want to solve for women who want roommates, right? You know they are the target audience. So this comes back to my uh, list of problems here, which is asking irrelevant questions or sending the survey to the wrong target audience, right? Because if you already decided you want to send it to women who want roommates, this question doesn't really make sense. Why do you want a roommate, right? Again, this question is irrelevant. People want a roommate because people want a roommate, right? Anybody who's going to be using the app 
are women who want to find a roommate. So it doesn't matter what their intent is. There can be hundred reasons why somebody wants a roommate. That's not important to us. What factors influence when you uh, of your choice when you pick a roommate, right? Now this makes a lot of sense, right? So what you can do is you can have a list of options, and you can let users pick from that. Now doing that again is unnecessary. If you are a woman who is designing this product, you pretty much know top five things that influence your decision, right? You may know five, but maybe there could be more. So if you're if the intent of this question is to identify all the factors, then it makes sense to ask this question, right? Do you prefer a roommate based on gender, right? Now this question again is a part of what factors influence. Gender is also one of the criteria over here, so this question is again irrelevant. How do you usually try and find a roommate? This is probably one of the most important questions or the most sensible question that I would ask because it's important to understand the current behavior of users. Now, the problem with this question is that it may or may not give answers that you can actually use. It may not give you actionable answers. Now, it's worth giving a shot. It's worth asking this question, but it, not, but it may not be fruitful. Okay. What makes you safe about a person you are living with? Again, this question is very similar to influence and gender um, because I'm sure that if safety is considered, then th that is going to influence the choice of picking a roommate, right? So all of these three questions, gender factors and uh, what makes you feel safe are pretty much the same thing. What do you look for in a person as a roommate? This question is a little vague. I'm not sure what that means, but anyway, let's move forward. If you already have a roommate, what made you settle down with them? Again, this again is the same thing as uh, what factors influence you when you pick a roommate. Because if you already have a roommate, then you probably ensure that they met all the categories. Maybe they should match your age. Maybe if you're a vegetarian, they should also be a vegetarian. Maybe if you're a student, they should also be a student. Maybe your vibes match. So all of these factors are already included when you're answering this question. Would you be interested in a future survey? Uh, regarding redesign of this app. So this is a question we're just asking follow up. Please, please share your email ID um, and your gender, right? So here it says this question is reg is is uh, required primarily to segregate between the response, response as the app is by and largely focused on women. So here again, if you have already decided that your target audience is women, it doesn't matter whether you're a male or a female. And typically you should have sent this to only women. Anyway, so again, coming back to all of this, in for me, the only question that I would even consider asking is what factors influence your choices to pick women and currently how do you go about um, finding a woman? These are the only two questions that I would ask and I would mainly do this over a video call or an audio call or an interview rather than a survey because the other questions weren't really fruitful and helpful. Okay, let's go to another survey which is over here. To understand how people use Medium, now Medium is a platform where you can write articles and you can read articles. Um, so it's uh, understanding how people use Medium and its bookmark feature in order to understand pain points and improve the reading experience. Now this is sort of a very vague and overall problem statement. And in the end, the users are people who consume content on Medium. So it's not for anybody who uses Medium because anybody who's using Medium is for people who could be writing on Medium or consuming content on Medium. So you want to send this to people who consume a lot of content on Medium and typically that's everybody else. There could be a very small percentage of people who actually write articles, but then the majority of people or 95% of the people read articles, right? So you could send this to anybody who uses Medium. Okay, so let's get started. So here again, name, email number, not relevant, right? Student, working professional, self-employed, how does it matter? Doesn't How does it matter whether I'm a student or a working professional or a self-employed over here? Because if you feel that you have features that are going to be specifically helpful for students, specifically helpful for working professionals, and specifically helpful for self-employed, that's good. You can solve for all these three people. Why do you have to ask that? Just solve for these three, these three type of people, right? Next, Age group. I think age group doesn't really matter here at all. It doesn't matter what your age is because in the end, your intent as a user is to consume content on medium. So your age doesn't really matter over here. Doesn't matter if you're 10 years old. Doesn't matter if you're 50 years old. The intent of the 20 year old person and the 50 year old person is going to be the same. Next, do you mostly use medium on mobile or desktop? Now here again, this is a good question, but again, this is an irrelevant question because there are people who, who, go, who are going to read on mobile. There are going to be people who are going to use on desktop. You cannot do a mobile versus desktop over here 
Because let's take an example. Let's say you sent it to 20 people and 15 of them said mobile. Does that mean you don't want to solve for people who use desktop? That's incorrect, right? And what if 15 people said desktop and five people said mobile? Are you not going to solve for people who use mobile? No, you're going to solve for people who use medium. That is the target user. So again, this is an irrelevant question. What do you use medium for? Stay up to date with industry trends, to increase domain knowledge, to know about a certain topic, all of the above. Again, how does it matter why somebody is coming to Medium, right? They are coming for different reasons. There can be even 10 different types of reasons. How does it matter? Because in the end, you're solving for people who are consuming content from Medium. It does not matter why they're consuming content. It is important that they're consuming content. That is the most important thing. So again, this question is irrelevant. Do you have a premium medium subscription? Now this question again does not make sense. Let me tell you why. Because if you want to solve for people who have a premium subscription, just solve for them. Doesn't matter if they have or if they have, if they don't. Again, if you send it to 20 people and 19 of them said that they don't, does that mean you're not going to solve for people who have a premium subscription? No, there are going to be people who have premium subscription. There are going to be people who don't have premium subscription. It doesn't matter. If you want to make it a paid feature, make it a paid feature. If you don't want to make it a paid feature, don't make it a paid feature. You cannot make that decision just by sending a survey to 15, 20 people. Doesn't make sense. Because if you are coming up with a feature or an experience that is very good, people are going to want to pay for it, right? So which means you can add it as a premium benefit in the premium subscription. And if you believe people are going to use it because it's valuable, what is the intent of asking this question? Doesn't matter. Okay, moving on. How much time do you spend on medium usually? Now, there's a big problem with the way the question is framed itself. Is five to 10 minutes per day, per week, per month, per year? What is it, right? How much, do you, how much time do you spend on medium usually, right? And to be honest, nobody keeps track. Am I spending five minutes? Am I spending half an hour? Am I spending one hour? Nobody keeps track of that time, right? And if you see over here, these buckets, five to 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, they are very so close to each other, right? Typically, whether I'm spending for five minutes or whether I'm spending for 30 minutes, my behavior or whoever I am, I am going to be the same person. There's a difference if you're somebody who spends for 15 minutes a day versus two hours a day versus five hours a day, right? If you were to say th three options such as one hour versus three hours versus 10 hours, then there's a significant difference. Because if I'm using for 10 minutes or I'm using for 30 minutes, there's not much of a difference of who I am. It's pretty much the same thing whether I use it for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. Okay, next. How often do you bookmark articles for lead, reading later? Now, we already know the answer to this. A lot of times, a lot of people, they already often bookmark articles. Now, even if this question is asked, right? In the end, we are already solving for people who bookmark, right? That was our target audience. So here again, it doesn't matter whether they often do it, whether they sometimes do it or never do it right? Saving things to bookmark is a very common experience, not just on Medium. It's common on Instagram. It's common on WhatsApp. It's common on Facebook. It's pretty much common on every app, even Twitter, for example, right? How many bookmarks have you saved in your reading list on Medium? Here again, 10 articles, 10 to 30 articles, 30 to 50 articles, more than 50 articles. Again, this question is all relevant. How does it matter how many I've saved? Because if you're designing a feature, it's going to help me even if I've saved 100 articles, even if I've saved two articles, right? That feature is going to be useful for anybody irrespective of how many articles they have saved. So here again, this question is irrelevant. How often do you check your bookmarks? Very often, sometimes rarely. Here again, there might be people who check it very often. There might be people who check it sometimes. There might be people who check it rarely, right? So let's say you sent it to nine people and three of them said very often, three of them said sometimes, and three of them said rarely. What are you going to do with that information? right? Because the intent of the user here is to consume content on medium, right? That is the intent. It doesn't matter how often they check their bookmarks, right? Next, on a scale of one to five, how hard or easy do you feel it is to find the relevant article, right? Again here, irrelevant question, because for some people, yes, it might be easy. For some people, it might be very hard, right? And obviously, you're pretty much going to be solving for people who find it hard or very hard, right? You're going to be solving for people who fall in the four to five category range. You're not going to be solving for people who are, fall in the one, two, three category. So why bother asking? Just directly solve for people who fall in the four to five category, right? You don't need to know how many people. It doesn't matter because there are going to be thousands and thousands of people who might fall in the four to five category. 
okay what do you do after going through your bookmark article archive it nothing let it just sit in my bookmarks or other again how does it matter what people do with it if you want to enhance the experience enhance the experience how is this question going to get you answers that are actionable right so again looking at all of this i would say that there was no need to send this survey at all because this had a combination of multiple mistakes which is sending it to the wrong audience asking the wrong questions okay so let's go to another one which is the final one which is this is an interesting one which is designing a virtual party platform experience for friends and family right now here the intent of sending this survey is to identify problems now if your intent is to identify problems you have to identify the current behaviors of people now this could also have been sent to identify who you want to solve for as well right so it could have been for this case where you want to send to identify behaviors and users this makes more sense than identifying problems because you still don't know who you who your users are okay so let's look at that survey number 1 age 13 13 to 17 18 to 22 23 to 27 now these questions the age are so close to each other that it's very hard to make some sort of an analysis from it right ideally i would say people who are in school right so whatever the age group is over there then people who are in their 20s to 30s or 20s to 40s and they're probably 40 above right because you're trying to go ahead and categorize them into different age groups because whatever your product is right let's say you come up with this product whether the person is 13 years old or whether the person is 22 years old there's not going to be any difference in the features they use all right even even let's say take let's take somebody who's 23 years old or let's say somebody is 40 years old how much of a difference is that going to make in the experience of product you're designing right it doesn't really matter moving on are you a student working professional or not now again here if you are trying to find out who you want to solve for that's okay but what i would do is if you want to interview students if you want information from students just interview students separately interview working professionals separately because you're going to get different answers from students and you're going to get different answers from working professionals you're going to get different answers from let's say a family uh, a group of family or whatever right a typical group call has how many friends again doesn't matter some groups will have 1 to 3 some groups will have more than 10 right it doesn't matter you can pick if you want to solve for more than 10 people and just start solving for all of them because if you are coming up with features or concepts you should solve for people who have 1 to 3 you should solve for people who have 4 to 6 you should have people who have 7 to 10 you should also solve for people who have more than 10 right you're not going to solve for only people who have more than 10 friends you're not going to solve for only people who have 1 to 3 friends right this product should be helpful for anybody who wants to have a virtual experience right how much time do you spend on average on group calls with your friends right please give your answer in numbers on minutes right here again is can totally vary sometimes it's a few minutes sometimes it's a few hours sometimes it can be a lot of hours right doesn't matter in the end you are going to cater to everybody describe what your typical calls with a friend look like now this is a good question that helps you understand the current behavior so what i would do here is i would not prepare a survey i would get on a call with some of my friends or family members and directly ask them this question how does your typical group call work like and they are going to start giving me so much information i'm going to start noting them down right because typing this question where describe what your typical call is like it's so hard to type that down right because these are more like feelings right you have to think about it and then it's so easy to talk about it rather than to type it down so this is a use case where i would say pick an interview over a survey then how frequently do you connect with your friends over a group call again every day five to six times a week three to four times a week one to two times a month it doesn't matter there are going to be people who fall into all of these categories because in the end you're going to be solving for all right and i'm very sure whatever solution or concept you come up with if that solution makes sense for somebody who uses one to two times a month that solution is also going to be helpful who uses the product five to six times a week right there can't be any difference as such over here how frequently do you engage with your family to do fun activities like watching movies here again people might fall into different categories so what are you going to do with that information right if you send it to 20 people and 18 of them say that they use 5 to 6 times a week does that mean you're not going to solve for people who use one to two times a month definitely not you are going to solve for everybody over here so this again is an irrelevant question 
What kind of activities do you do online with your friends, right? So this, this is an interesting one, but I'm assuming the intent of this question is to identify more than all of this. So just hang out, watch movies, play video games, live sports, shows, dinner party, etc., whatever it is, right? So this again would be nice to have as an interview question where you ask the person face to face, what and all do you guys do when you're hanging out with your friends or family? Please select which of the following are uh, done, frequently done to never done. Okay, so here again, right? So frequently sometimes really never again all of these questions all of these activities people do it everybody does it differently there might be a very large group of audience who just hangs out there might be a large of group of people who never watch live sports or you know use or who watch a lot of live sports or some people who play less games or some people who always play games right so there can be a collection of this it doesn't matter because if you are coming up with all of these different types of features the respective user group is going to end up using that feature if you're come if you're trying to do something which which has related to gaming there are going to be people who are never going to use it but the people who are going to play video games a lot are going to use that feature please select which device you're more likely to use on for the following activities mobile laptop and ipad now here again it doesn't matter because there are going to be people who use mobile there are going to be people people who are going to use laptop and there are going to be people who do it on ipad now i understand what the intent of this question is the intent of this question is to identify for which platform do you want to design the experience but like i said if you come up with a feature people use all of these three platforms so just design features that work across all the three platforms or design separate features that work for mobile separate features for design for laptop and separate features that work for ipad as well or separate features that you know work combined on laptop and tablet right it doesn't matter you don't have to ask this question design for all of them because there are users who are going to be on all three platforms then which platforms do you usually use to make a group call whatsapp facetime instagram all of these things right so here again it doesn't matter we pretty much know that whatsapp and facetime are probably the most popular ones and if the intent of this question is to identify which platform you want to design features for you can do it you don't even have to ask this question you can directly design it for whatsapp altogether without asking anybody because we know people make a lot of whatsapp calls we know people make a lot of facetime calls so just design features for them already there's no point in asking this question here again how frequently doesn't matter how frequently i might want to use your feature if i use whatsapp frequently i might want to use your feature if i use if i never use whatsapp or sometimes use whatsapp right now obviously never doesn't matter over here it's only sometimes and frequently so whether i use it frequently or whether i use it sometimes i might still want to use your feature it doesn't matter finally your email address and name to end it over there i hope that makes a lot of sense right and I'm going to sort of recap all of this and right when you are thinking of your next product design problem statement just look at these three things first of all is there even a need for me to do a survey right will i actually get more information from doing a survey if you believe yes you need more information i would suggest do an interview instead of a survey interviews are much more helpful and stronger and once you do that make sure you send it to the right target audience which is super critical super important and once you get your answers please don't blindly believe from what people said think about it discuss with other people they could be your mentors you could be they could be your designers whatever it is and don't blindly believe what people say right and of course um it you will end up asking irrelevant questions in a survey but when you are having a one on one interview with someone you are typically not going to ask irrelevant questions you are going to uh, ask questions that make a lot of sense right so that's pretty much it for this video guys thank you guys so much for watching hope you guys really enjoyed it if you did let me know in the comment section down below make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more amazing awesome content and i'll see you guys in my next video so that take care and bye bye